Hi, good morning everybody. I think this is like a, a bit of an old biography. Just let me tell you something about myself very briefly. I am indeed the founder of um, EVA, Ethical Vegetarian Alternative, but I left recently as director and I, while I was doing this, like uh, talking to people, talking to consumers about why they should uh, reduce their meat consumption or go vegan, uh, right now I'm uh, more doing something like this. I'm um, kind of like I've gone to meta activism, which is to say like I try to help activists be better activists and reach more people in a more effective way. That's kind of what I do now with these talks and also with um, my blog, Vegan Strategist. All right. So what I want to do in this talk is, um, after the introduction, I will um, formulate the challenge that we're up against, the challenge in veganizing the world. Um, and I will talk about the why. The why is uh, why we say that people should do whatever we want them to do, what reasons we give them to do what we want them to do. Is it animal rights? Is it something else? I will talk about the what. What is the message that we ideally tell them? Is it go vegan? Is it something else? And uh, the how will be uh, treated in my talk tomorrow at 10. Okay? So you have to come back. So, by way of introduction, first of all, um, I always say our intentions are the same. We want a vegan world. We want, yes, uh, a world without, um, without suffering for animals. And um, while these intentions are very noble and are the same for everybody, our strategies may differ, right? So let's keep that in mind. If you don't agree with somebody, let's keep in mind that they have the same great intentions, usually. Um, that being said, I think we can and we should discuss strategy because there's some strategies that are better than others, some strategies are counterproductive, etc. And it is true that some strategies may like perfectly well coexist and that they're complementary, but that doesn't... Um, um, necessarily make it, makes it okay to say that uh, every strategy and every approach is fine and we need a bit of everything. No, we need to look for the thing that works best. And I'm giving you just my own opinion about what works well or good or best, uh, and there's no need to agree with me. In fact, I, I um, expect you to disagree with me unless you are very intelligent, okay? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, actually, there's a lot of people who dis... Well, not a lot, but there's people who quite... Um, quite rapidly disagree with me on some things, so I expect some controversy. And in this uh, talk, I will be limited to food. I will limit myself to food, to the, to the issue of vegan diets, all right? So first of all, what do we want? This is kind of what we want. This is a, a depiction of a vegan world. Um, it's a, 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 a world completely consisting of vegetables. Uh, and fruits. You see, like, uh, there's a broccoli forest and this cart is made of bread and uh, there's um, all kinds of fruits in the air. So this is the idea we have for a completely vegan world. And um, if we look at this more concretely, what do we want? What do we want of people? And if you look at that, there's two dimensions. One is uh, the dimension of um, what do they eat and how much do they, how often do they eat vegan? And we want them to move up all the way to the right. Right? We want them to be vegan. Okay? So there's the Meatless Monday people, the Demeterians, the half vegetarians, and the vegetarians, the veganish people, and etc. etc. So there's a scale from omnivore to vegan. And there's a second dimension, which is about the motivations that people have for eating that way. So they can have no reason just because they don't like meat. Okay? Or they can have health reasons or whatever. But ideally, I think you agree with me on an animal rights congress. Ideally, they have the animal motivation. They are motivated for animals. Yeah, he confirms. Or she. Um, so, we, uh, we want people to do the right things for the right reasons. We want them to be vegan for the animals. I think you agree with that. And so, oops, I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, so, this is all wrong. I mean, these, these, these lightning bolts are what we don't want. The only thing that we want is this, right? <laughs> Vegan for the animals, okay? Well, <laughs> thanks for the applause, but now I'm going to say like that it's not necessarily the best thing to do. <laughs> Um, so there's three key mes messages that I want to give you here uh, and that I hope you understand a bit after the talk. We don't need to talk about animals and morality all the time, so this is the why. We don't need to, to use 
animal morality or animal ethics or whatever as, as the, the motivation all the time. Don't walk out of the room yet. I will explain why that is. We don't need to ask everyone to go vegan all the time. That may not be the fastest way to do things, to get this vegan world. And thirdly, what is efficient, what is important to do, what is the right strategy is very much dependent on time. And I mean the time in the history and the evolution of our movement. What works today may not work tomorrow. What may work tomorrow may not work today, etc. So there are things that I see happening today that I say like this is an okay strategy but it probably will be more effective in 10 years time and it's too early now okay so we have to take into account where people are and where our movement is so and then one last thing by way of introduction the question is not can they reason nor can they talk but can they suffer you all know that quote from Jennifer Bentham okay so I made my own version of that quote the question is not am I right or is this my truth but does this work okay does this work? Does this work is the most important question. Does this have impact? Does this change things? Does this open people's hearts and minds to go closer to becoming vegan, to, become cl to go closer to uh, care about animals? All right? So that being said, let's look at the challenge. The challenge that is ahead of us, at first it doesn't look very good. Okay, so we have a certain amount of meat consumption today in 2015, and what is, ex is expected is that by 2050, the uh, demand for meat for animal products in general will uh, double. And that is especially because people in China and India are um, increasing their meat consumption because they are getting richer. When a country gets richer, they start to eat more meat. You may be familiar with the three ends of justification by Melanie Joy. So I, um, I made five ends, uh, just I added some ends because I think three were not enough. Um, animal products are normal, they are natural, they're seen as it's natural to eat meat, we've done it for thousands of years, etc. They're necessary, nutritionally necessary, we need them um, to be healthy is what many people think still. Uh, they are nice, tasty, right? Um, and they are not the first thing we worry about. There's a lot of other things that uh, get our attention that um, are um, to us seem more important or to omnivores seem more important. There's a lot of possible answers to the question, why do most people eat meat? My answer to that is most people eat meat because most people eat meat. Okay? Most people do what other people do. Okay? And if, if, if somebody would be tempted to doubt his or her eating meat, they would probably say like, yeah, well, there seems to be something wrong with all this suffering and killing of animals, but 95, 97% of the population is doing it, so it can't be that bad, so I can't be a bad person because everybody's doing it, okay? So one of the most important things is that we get critical mass. Critical mass, as many people as possible who are into this. Unfortunately, it looks like this for many people. Vegan is like on the other end of a chasm. It doesn't, it's not easy for most people. And we can say, we can repeat, uh, Till, till forever, that it is easy, but if people don't experience it as easy, it is not easy to them. So it's not up to us to say what's easy for them, okay? So it, it means swimming against the stream, going against what other people do, and that doesn't make it easy. So economists talk in terms of when, when, when or psychologists, when they talk about behavior, they can talk about behavior that is costly. Costly in the sense that it costs a lot. So I think at this point in time, for most people, compassion costs too much. It is too difficult to be compassionate, because if you are compassionate, if you see, okay, we should care about animals, then you have to change kind of your life, okay? You may disagree with this, because you experience it as easy, but you're different by definition almost than all these other people, because you are there already, you're the early adopters, Okay, you are people who changed already, so you are probably quite different than other people. Even if these other people also agree that animal suffering is wrong, but they will need more motivation, or we will need to make it easier for them. Okay, so how will we ever get to this vegan world? So let me start with instead of the what, let me start with the why. This is sorry for the cruel image, but this is a why for me. Um, we want to stop this. We see in this animal, we see the fear, we see that this is like an animal that wants to live and we kill it, we make it suffer. Okay, and we do this with 60 billion animals a year. Okay, I'm sure that this is most of your motivation as well. On the other hand, imagine 
that you are in India, in a country where meat hangs without refrigeration on those stalls, and you think it's, you're not a, a vegan, you're an omnivore. And you see this, and you think, this is pretty disgusting, it's unhygienic, and it's probably uh, infested with worms or whatever. And you say, like, yeah, and at the same time, these people here in India, they have these wonderful vegetarian dishes, so I'm going to try vegetarian for a while, okay? Can you see that there, there's no moral reasoning involved? This is just like, I don't like this, this is disgusting, okay? So I'm going to eat vegetarian here. So what I want to get to is there's different factors that can lead people to veganism or to eating less meat or whatever. On the one hand, there's moral factors like we all have. We are vegan because of vegetarian or whatever, wherever you are. Um, we are vegan for the animals because we care. But you can uh, be changing things for other reasons, for non-moral reasons. I um, symbolize this by lab meat. By, by, this is about the availability of alternatives, okay? It will become, yeah, thank you. It will become clear later. Um, so moral factors are, for instance, um, how, many an how the animals are treated, that the fact that animals have to die, the environmental factors, the world global hunger thing, um, possibly religious reasons for some, etc. And we have a whole arsenal of moral tools and we use moral education uh, to change people. We talk about all these things, about the animals, etc., in our websites, in our magazines, at conferences, at protests. We organize direct action to, to make people think and believe that animals are a moral concern. Okay? On the other hand, there's the non-moral factors. That's just the availability around us of the alternative. That's a non-moral factor. Like People would be more inclined to eat more vegetarian vegan food when this is all around them, even without realizing why they do it even while they don't have a reason, okay? So, and the non-moral tools are like restaurants and shops and apps and uh, all kinds of things. The products, these are non-moral. This is the environment around you. This is not in your head. This is around you, okay? But our movement is focusing very much on these moral things, okay? We are trying to convince other people of morally caring about animals. We're trying to convince them of ethics, okay? And one reason is because we think that works, and it does to a certain extent. If you look at the anti-slavery um, movement in the United States, um, you see here um, three millions of our fellow beings are in chains. That's a moral appeal, right? We are telling people like, our brothers and sisters are in chains, this is not right, they're the same as us, they suffer as us, we have to help them, a moral appeal. Okay, this helped to a certain extent, but this was not everything. Okay, so what was invented at that time was the steam engine. And the steam engine made it cheaper sometimes to have uh, mechanical labor rather than slave labor. So can you imagine that this was a very important thing to move away from slavery? Another factor was the war. The South stopped with slavery because the North won them, uh, conquered them in a war. It's a, not a moral thing, it was a war. Okay, so keep in mind that when, when change happens, it's not necessarily, even though we want it to be, it's not necessarily all for moral reasons. But still, we focus on these moral reasons because, like I said, we want, we want it to be a moral fight. We want it to be, we want people to care about these moral things. We want people to care about animals, okay? We want people to do the right thing for the right reasons. And we distrust the health vegans, right? Do we trust this person? Like, if she's just a healthy, we have like we, we're kind of like, uh, yeah, uncomfortable with this because she could be, she could be become a non-vegan every day, right? If she just cares about health, see, health and ethics are kind of like juxtaposed, like against each other. I don't know what Gary Yurovsky is saying here about health figures, but I'm I'm sure it's not something good. Um, so, all right. So remember, compassion costs too much. Compassion costs too much and we have to make it cheaper. And look at this, alternatives and effort. The more, the less alternatives, the higher your effort has to be. And alternatives, you can see this not in just in terms of meat alternatives, but in terms of the availability of the alternative for the omnivore lifestyle or the omnivore diet. Imagine this, imagine we all agree that flying is bad for the environment. I guess we all agree about that, okay? But what is our alternative? It's hard to think of, of good alternatives. I mean, short distance is okay, but if I want to be in the US because my family is there, because I have to talk there, I mean, I can go with a boat and it takes me 10 days. 
It's not a very good alternative. So the more alternatives we have, the lower your effort. Okay? So imagine, um, so this would be the good uh, situation. Imagine this is the only thing you could eat as a vegan, except for meat, of course. Who among you would still be vegan? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, you're saying yes, and maybe you would be, but uh, the hard thing is, like, would you have gone vegan if this was the only thing available? I think maybe one person, like a monk, went vegan um, when he only, or they could only eat this. But then imagine, like, 30 years ago, microbiotics, uh, you know, we discovered, like, we could cook beans and, and, and legumes, and we, uh, legumes and grains, and we can combine them, and we have complete proteins, and we have, yeah, we have something that we can work with, and we have good meals, and so some more people uh, can change. Imagine then that we have really good meat substitutes, like tofurkey or something, okay? So it's easy to see how that becomes even uh, better or facilitates your change. You don't realize it, but what, this played a role in your going vegan or vegetarian, right? It did. You don't know how, much, how, how big a part it played, but it played a part, okay? If, if it had been very difficult, maybe you would have gone vegan. Um, and then imagine meat that is exactly the same as, well, Fake meat that is exactly the same as real meat, lab meat, okay? And probably even more people, if we can convince them that it's not nasty and, and horrible, um, would go vegan, okay? <clears throat> so this is another way to describe it. This is a, uh, a Paul Volter. And on the one hand, this is the moral thing. This is the moral part. On the one hand, we can talk to her <clears throat> and say, come on, you're the best, and you can do it, and you can increase your skills, and you can jump over that, and you can be the world champion, and we motivate her. We talk to her, to her head, okay? And then there's the other part. And can you guess what it is here? What is it? Huh? The body we can give her skills to, yeah, we can train her, but there's something else? Lowering the bar, very good. So we can lower the bar and make it easier to go vegan, okay? Very important. So what if eating vegan meals all the time would be so easy that people would do it without even caring for animals. That would be... Nah. <laughs> we wouldn't like that. We wouldn't trust all these people who would be vegan for not for animal reasons, right? It would be terrific, but still we wouldn't really trust it. But there's good news. Because change can happen in two ways, okay? On the one hand, we can influence people's attitude. But on the other hand, we can influence people's behavior. In our movement, we usually work like this, okay? We tell people this and this happens to the animals, and then we hope that they will change their behavior, okay? That's the most, that's what we, how we work most. However, apart from this direction, it also goes in this direction. When we change people's behavior, they may develop different attitudes. So changing their behavior first means they don't have these reasons yet. Okay, look at this. These are two people who are essentially doing the same thing. They're both killing cows. Okay? This is a matador, a, a, a bullfighter, and this is a butcher. Right? Who are we most frustrated and angry at? And also, who are omnivores most frustrated and angry at or with? They will be much more frustrated with this one. Okay? And some people will say, yeah, that's because we see... Um, meat eating as something necessary, or they see meat eating as something necessary and bullfighting as entertainment. And that's part of it, even though I don't think entertainment is less valuable in this sense than, uh, than meat eating, which you don't need, okay? Um, but the main thing here is that people who are against it, who are against this but not against this, are invested in this and not in this. They participate in this but not in this. It's like fur. It's very easy to be against fur if you don't wear a fur coat, right? If you don't have a fur coat. Okay, so the behavior that you participate in is very difficult to judge. Does that make sense? Okay, so the other way around, if you would already eat vegan or vegetarian dishes now and then, for whatever reason, it becomes a lot more easier to be open to the animal rights argument. Okay, it's like, for instance, I have a cell phone, I use it a lot, and I know there's stuff wrong with cell phones, with the ingredients of cell phones. There's, there's being sourced in Africa, etc. But I really have, I mean, can you imagine if I had a fair phone, where supposedly that's not the case, that's, that's like fair and that's okay, that I would be much more inclined to read all those articles about the bad things that happen with normal phones, and I would say, <laughs> I'm not part of that, you know? Yeah. So, 
the important message here is that non-moral factors enable the moral factors. If there's alternatives, they make it easier for people to see that it's a moral problem and to be open to these nasty animal rights activists and vegans and to listen to their message. Okay? All right. So let's look at a number of things, and um, this is a, a, a positive intermezzo, um, a number of things that people are doing today to make compassion easier, or that will make sure that compassion, that compassion, that caring about animals becomes easier. So this is um, Pat Brown. I met him five years ago, and right then he had just left the University of Stanford. He's a chemist, he's a professor, he's like a really brilliant guy. And he uh, left his work to work on the ideal meat substitute. And right now, he has developed the Impossible Burger, and uh, the Impossible Burger is so real that it actually bleeds a little bit. So it leaves like a little trail of reddish, bloodish something in your plate. So I'm not saying this is like the perfect sales um, um, pitch for him, but um, it just shows like how he's interested in making something that's just as good as meat or better. Okay, and it's called uh, the Impossible Burger. And recently, this little company offered him $300 million to buy his company, but he refused. Okay, he's just going alone. Um, so, this is the Impossible Cheeseburger. Do you know this guy? Josh Tetrick from Beyond Eggs. So, this guy said, like, What's the most horrible thing happening in the um, farm agriculture world for animals today? And he concluded this was chickens egg laying hands. So he said like, let's make an alternative for um, eggs, for egg products. So what they did was with uh, Hampton Creek Foods, they um, developed a mayonnaise that's now everywhere, in, uh, everywhere available in the United States, even in Walmart. And um, what happened was that uh, recently they, I mean still, they have uh, avian flu in the United States, they have a shortage of chickens and eggs, and people are calling these guys, uh, people who, uh, companies who use eggs in their products, they're calling them and saying like, we, have, we don't have enough eggs, can you give us some of your substitute, we want to try it. Can you imagine how, how great that is? And now last week or this week in the press, there was a whole... Um, there was in the press a whole story about how the whole egg board or the egg industry is conspiring against them and trying to tackle them because they see this as a major threat. So this is a major victory for them because now everybody sees the egg industry as evil, you know, because they're trying to tackle like a small little company. All right. So Beyond Eggs is, is really, you should follow them. It's really a very interesting story that's unfolding there. All right. These guys are trying to make milk, not just milk like soy milk or almond milk, but milk, I mean, milk not from cows that is identical to cow's milk, okay? They're trying to make milk that is just, that has the same exact nutrients or is even better. And they suspected or they wanted to be on the market by uh, next year or the year after. Can you imagine what a game changer this would be to have like the same milk that people are used to but not from cows? So it would be like, it's like a high-tech thing that some of you may be against, I'm not. Um, so it's like a, a yeast that they like engineer with the DNA of a cow, etc. And uh, there's no cows that need to suffer for that. Uh, and it would be just the same thing as the real thing. The real thing, which is pretty disgusting anyway, but if people want it, I mean, who am I to, to say they shouldn't drink that? So it's called Moo Free, Moo Free, okay? So without the Moo. Um, same thing for cheese. Some people are really waiting for the right cheese to come along, right? Um, so um, these guys are making, trying to make real cheese based on this, uh, this, this strange milk, this milk that's from a cow but not from a cow, okay? So we will have, we may have like the same cheese as that was what we have right now in, in, in the original form, but different. This guy wants to make fake leather based on cell cultures, okay, with his company Modern Meadow. And this guy, Mark Post, has produced the first in vitro meat burger for $250,000. He believes it can be marketable in five to seven years. All right? Another game changer. So what could happen is that the people who want these products, they can still have them, but there's no animals involved anymore. Wouldn't that be incredible? Okay? And can you imagine how easily it would change their perception and their thinking about animals? when they're not invested anymore, they don't have anything to lose anymore, they know like, okay, we can keep these products, so now I can start caring about animals. All right? Some other examples in the US, Native Foods Cafe and Veggie Grill, two chains that are um, really um, 
developing very fast and they want to have like a couple of hundred restaurants within the, the next couple of years. Okay, so they're vegan restaurants. All right, so let's recap. The why being vegan is going against the stream. The reasons don't matter all that much. Okay, we can start for whatever reason, for health reasons, for because there's in our environment there's good vegetarian food, etc. It's very important to increase the availability of the alternative so that the effort, the required motivation to become vegan is lowered. We want that the motivation that's required to become vegan is as low as possible. Okay, we want to make it as easy as possible. And behavior can influence attitude. All right? Good. Then the what, what are we going to ask? This is maybe the most controversial part. So intuitively we are inclined to ask the people the behavior that we want in the end, which is go vegan, right? And the argument for that is, well, uh, we cannot ask for anything less because we think it's immoral to ask for anything less. And that may make some like intuitive theoretical sense, okay? But I, th I don't think it's the best way to approach this. So, I think people are, um, it's not just that I think that, but research points out that people are more likely to do something if you don't ask for too much, if you ask small steps, okay? Reducers may become vegans, and this is also very clear from research. People's motivations may change from health to animal rights, also very clear from research. And many reducers together may tip the system faster than a low percentage of vegans, okay? You have to remember, well, I'll show it with a lesson from another, it's not a movement, but this, um, this woman represents a person who's really gluten intolerant, right? It's a matter of life and death for her, life or death, right? If she eats something with gluten, she kind of like gets an allergic reaction, all right? So she says on the one hand, like, I mean, you know that today there's like about 10% of the people who are not gluten intolerant or, or allergic, but who try to avoid gluten. And it makes no sense, apparently. Okay? I mean, scientifically, there seems to be no reason, but people think that it does. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying, like, science says it's no use to avoid it, but they do. Okay? So, but there are much more, there are many more people of those people than these, like, 1% or part of a percentage of really um, allergic people. Okay, but what happened for this person, for this person who was really allergic, on the one hand, it, it created kind of a confusing situation for people, like if she has to explain in a restaurant that she's really, really gluten intolerant and she cannot have anything, and the waiter says, yeah, but we had some people here and they were not so, not so uh, strict about it. You know the situation, right, with veganism, it's, it's parallel. But on the other hand, she says, like, all these fakers, they made sure I have a much bigger choice of products right now. Can you see the parallel? The fact that you can find a lot of vegetarian vegan products in the supermarket is thanks to the meat reducers. Because they are a much bigger group that makes it interesting for a lot of companies to cater to them. Okay, it's not because of a small number of vegans. So what happened, that a big number of fakers created a big choice. And it would be, it could be, it can be, it will be, it is, the same situation in our movement, there's a small number of vegans, a bigger portion of vegetarians, and a much more portion of meat reducers, okay? So what these reducers do is on the one hand, they have the most impact on diminishing suffering because they're more, there's more of them. Even though they don't, don't go all the way, if you add it all up, they're saving more animals together than uh, the number of vegans together. And also important, they make it easier for people, for everyone to go vegan. The more alternatives you have, the more easier it gets. So, don't roll your eyes at meat reducers, okay? They're helpful. <laughs> They're important. <laughs> if you look, and this is going back to the why for a second, if you look at the motivations of these meat reducers, so I'm not saying the motivations of vegans, but the motivations of meat reducers, they have other motivations than vegans. Health and taste are their primary motivations. So we have to use those, I think. We have to talk about those. Right. So now let's put the why and the what together. We've said we want people to be vegan and to believe that animals are not here for our use. We want to go, people to go vegan for the right reasons. Okay? Right here. We want them there. But right now, if you look at the situation of how many people do these things and how they're motivated, 
this is where the big crowds are. Okay? Very important. And they are mo motivated by other things. But the good news is, and this is a repetition, but just to make it clear, as choices increase, becoming stricter gets a lot easier. Okay? So you don't have to, like, despair about people not going all the way yet, and they make exceptions for this and for that. It's not that bad. It will become a lot easier along the way. And I see no reason why ever a society that's, for instance, 90% vegan would stop there. I mean, if we care so much, if it's so convenient already, we will uh, also remove the 10% that's still problematic. All right? I'm sure of that. And as people eat vegan, as they try vegan without whatever, for whatever reason, for no reason maybe, as they try it out, their defense goes down and their compassion can grow. All right? So they will end up right where we want them in the end. It's a more indirect form of getting to the goal, but I think it's a faster goal. Now, what I've suggested, what I've presented so far is a pragmatic approach. So it's about reducing. It's about allowing people to reduce for any reason. Any reason whatsoever is fine. It's about increasing their skills, their cooking skills, etc. And it's about, especially about the focus on the env environment, on what's around them, on making it easier. That's one approach. There's also another approach, and that is the more ideological moral approach, and that approach says go vegan, do it for the animals, become active, become an activist, and it's really ideologically inspired, it's about anti-speciesism, etc. I'm not saying that this approach is the wrong approach, on the contrary. What I just think is that in this stage in our movement, the first approach, the pragmatic approach, is more important. And I think we will, and this is the point about time, I think we will, I don't know if you understand this, but it's like as we move along, it's more and more of the blue approach, more and more of the ideological go vegan approach and less of the pragmatic approach. So first we have to make it easier. We have to create a fertile breeding ground for vegans, all right, with this pragmatic approach. And then it becomes a lot easier to go all the way and to become and to tell people about this anti the speciesist ideology, anti speciesist ideology, etc. All right? It does it, it means that right now the default option would be like suppose I give you 10 million dollars or euros to have a campaign on TV and you reach the lowest common denominator, you reach like everybody in the society, then I would say like choose like a reducitarian health-based message, okay? So that's like your default thing. Reduce animal products, you can say eat more plant products, try meat alternatives, try vegetarian meals, have one or more meatless days, go vegetarian. The go vegan message I think is at this point um, less interesting to reach large crowds, okay? So this is a, um, a pamphlet from uh, Animal Equality that I, I got yesterday, and see, there's no, like, go vegan on, on the, the cover. It says, make a difference why millions of people are changing the way they eat, and there's no vegan uh, inside, in, in, there's no mentioning of the word. So some people say, like, oh, you don't have to think that vegan is a scare word, and you're scared of mentioning veganism, etc. It's not about being scared, it's about attracting people. Okay, it's about also about doing what re research says is the most effective. And organizations like Animal Equality and others are very much listening to the research instead of like their, their own gut feeling or just saying what we want to say, you know? Saying what, like telling everything and, and whatever we want to tell them to people. No, it's about listening to reason and about listening to research, okay? So I'm not saying also that at this point it's wrong to ever mention vegan, of course not. There's, there's a lot of examples or a lot of situations in which you can talk about veganism. I mean, you can have people who are really interested and they want to like, ask you and have a discussion and then you talk about going vegan all the way and about the philosophy and the ideology behind it. If you are talking to younger people, it may be also more attractive to talk about like the, the full Monty, okay? It, um, if you're talking about uh, academic students or philosophers, it may be very interesting to talk about uh, the, whole, the whole thing, all right? And, also, just now and then, like with, with Eva, our organization, we do this, we use the word uh, vegan, we use the word vegetarian, we use the word plant-based, and so the word ve vegan is like interjected there to make people get used to it. But I wouldn't like use it consistently um, all the time, which some people say we have to, I don't, I don't agree with that. So the art of activism, I think, is the right approach at the right time. You do what is most effective at a certain moment. Right? 
So, to finish, let's look at the future, let's look at what may happen, let's look at how we can get there, and what may happen before we get there. I think several things are possible. Meat may become too expensive first. Too expensive because there's all these problems involved, sustainability problems, health problems, okay? So it may be that it's not affordable in the future. It may become too dangerous. We have escaped some outbreaks now and then maybe someday we hit, we'll hit the big one and, and, and people, in conjunction with the other reasons, people are going to say like, hmm, it's getting too dangerous to, to breed these animals in, in captivity and, and, and like in close confinement, etc. Meat may become redundant because of uh, the creativity of great chefs who show us that it's not really necessary at all anymore. If you have a great meal, I, I'm sure you've had it at some point and you've, you've, you've made, you had a thought like, who would miss meat in a meal like this, you know? And we can convince people like that. Food is very important. Or it may become uh, yeah, redundant. It may become redundant also because of more high-tech solutions. And then, finally, maybe after these steps, meat becomes immoral. And then we'll have the world we want. And in the next part, I will tell you how you can communicate personally um, in a way that, that jives with, with this strategy if you're interested. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for questions if, um, yeah. if you want. Um, um, I don't know how to get how to formulate the question. Um, at the end of what I want to um, say, you're talking about the um, what first to do, making it redundant, etc., and um, um, making it easier for people to to have options. Um, uh, I've been active uh, for for 30 years now. In the beginning, we just had, if you could find it, tofu in the supermarket, and now it's really, really easy to eat vegan. Um, in Holland, though, we have um, what would be compared with the RSPCA, the biggest welfareist organization, the Dierenbescherming, we call them. They have uh, started a, um, uh, you're Belgian, right? A yeah. Keurmerk? Um, 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 a label. A label, label um, with um, three stars. Mm -hmm. And they are labeling stars on um, um, animal corpses. And they are um, putting this in supermarkets, and this means that our, let's call them RSPCA, dierenbescherming, is actually selling meat. And they're also putting stars on meat from intensive farming. So they're actually going back the other way. And they're the most influential, richest organization. What, yeah, so the question is, what to do about this? Yeah. Um, so this is, of course, the whole question of, of humane or happy meat, you know, or, or of saying that some meat is better than, than other meat. I think f just several points that I, I want to say here. We shouldn't, I think, as activists, ignore the matter of animal welfare. There's some people like um, who will say, like, oh, this is all not important. This is leading us in the wrong direction. Like, for instance, McDonald's announced yesterday that it was going cage-free. Uh, for the whole, for its whole operation, I think this is an important step because if you are a chicken, it matters to you how much room you have, etc. If you're in jail, it matters how how your circumstances are, etc. That being said, uh, I think the most problematic thing is 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 to give the idea to people that it's good. I think a lot of problems would be solved if we, but of course it's hard to say that. But um, if if we could call this slightly less horrible meat or something, okay? It's, it, it's not going to be on the label like that, of course, but, uh, but it's all in the name, and we cannot call it better because it's not that much better, but I think uh, it is they important. Are actually, they are, they're calling it animal-friendly meat. I know, and, and that's the problem. It shouldn't be called animal-friendly problem. There is no such thing as animal-friendly meat, of course, right? Um, so I think that the problem is in the names. So that being said, I think it's problematic that, that yeah, we're telling people that some meat is animal friendly, etc. But it may, it may have some bonuses or some good effects that you may not intuitively expect. It may make meat more expensive, etc. So there's, it's a difficult, a difficult um, discussion, but um, we, we, we cannot be simplistic about it. We should, we should tell people like, yeah, 
what I'm, what I'm always saying is like when people want to change things, there's two ways of being of, of incrementalism, right? There's two, two, two ways of gradation. You can eat less meat or you can eat different meat. And this different meat is not interesting at all. It's not, I mean, that I never recommend, like eat other meat. I always recommend like eat less meat. Okay, so I think like if if a person approaches you and they say like um, yeah I want to I want to do something tell them like start with a, a meatless Monday or whatever uh, start your incrementalism like that and don't say that the, that 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 uh, they can eat that there is something like animal friendly meat even though some meat will be less harmful than other meat um, yeah all right. Because um, we are communicating people to either go less or completely, let's say, cruelty-free. Mm -hmm. Because we use the word um, eat animal-friendly, eat, eat die vriendelijk. Yeah. But when, when, uh, we've had it even when we are communicating, communicating this um, um, and, and, and pointing out people towards the, the, the plant-based lifestyle, mm -hmm. that this dierenbescherming is going against our message mm -hmm. and telling people... Um, once we've had our communication, and they're telling people, go to the supermarket and buy our meat. Yeah. So they're actually going against us, yeah. so mm -hmm. to say. Yeah, I think that's not a, not a very good evolution. And, um, and I think, uh, I mean, what could be done is, uh, is lobbying with the... Uh, I think there was another country where some, um, some vegans recently got into the, the big animal uh, welfare... Organ I don't know what, what country it was exactly... Um, and and trying to change it from from within. So I think this is this is evolution. It 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 may sometimes not look like progress, but I mean, uh, years ago these people were only concerned with cats and dogs. Now they're at least concerned with the, the welfare of other animals. So in a sense, you could you could see it as a positive thing too. Uh, but I agree. I, I would I would try to lobby to change this to change this from within and to 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 make them see that this can be it can be damaging. Uh, I don't really have a question. Where are you? Hello, I'm here. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I don't really have a question, rather something like a thought. Um, I'm from Otwarte Klatki, it's open cages in Poland. Uh, we are quite a young organization and we are trying to uh, introduce uh, your point of um, view in our activities very hard now, which is not quite easy. Mm -hmm. And because uh, in Poland, m Poland is, uh, I think, quite young uh, when, when it comes to veganism, you know, uh, animal rights, etc. And there are a lot of so-called angry vegans mm -hmm. in Poland. And I, I have to confess, I am angry vegan in my head still. Yeah. <laughs> also, I'm, I'm trying to fight it. Uh, but we, mm, what I want to say, we really can't afford being angry vegans. Mm -hmm. It's it's totally against our goals, and and it, I think we really work. We we have to work hard on um, going away from from yeah. that uh, point of view. And uh, what I want to say also, we you didn't really uh, say a lot about psychology, right? I'm not psychologist myself, but uh, I think psychology makes it quite clear that praising people works much better than criticizing people. Yeah. And also it's very hard to say, oh, it's fine that you eat meat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but we should really um, uh, tell people things like, oh, I'm really happy, or it's really good that you reduced eating yeah. meat, right? Because there are some occasions to say things like that, and I, I think we don't really articulate it, yeah. right? We don't say people such mm -hmm. things. I, I'll Thanks. talk more about this. Uh, thank you. I, I'll talk more about the psychology and, and the one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings uh, tomorrow. But uh, yeah, I think it's very important. I, th I think it's also important that you try to make yourself believe this. You know, try to make yourself believe that people are okay. They're good. They have good intentions. They care about animals. That you really believe that every step that they take is good, and then they will feel it from you. They will feel that you mean it. It's 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 really important to believe that. I have needed a couple of years to, to, to really believe it too. And, and, and I think now I, I really do. And I think it's, it's easy to praise people for that. And at the same time pointing out, but you don't really have to point it out because you yourself being a vegan is already showing them that there's more steps to take. So it's not necessary to like make it more explicit. Like, okay, yeah, you have taken a, lot, a, a good step, but like now let's go for the other step. I mean, there, there, is, there are ways to put that nicely, but um, you shouldn't overestimate. You shouldn't underestimate the effect that your being vegan 
already has on them. You know, they uh, they already see that there's more steps to take just by by you being there. Yeah. But I agree with we should get away from anger, and it's it's our love rather than our anger that will get us the vegan world. So uh, thank you for your presentation. That's uh, exactly the point I want to. Um Uh, ask something about. Uh, I think you said, said great things because uh, when I'm uh, at the street and uh, people see my action and people go home, of course I want that they reduce their meat uh, consumption, animal products consumption, of course I want that they go vegetarian, but for many um, um, animal rights activists and for me as well, I think it's very important, it's a matter of uh, consciousness. I don't want to say this, I don't want to say Uh, go vegetarian because otherwise I would feel guilty mm -hmm. and I think many people in this room have this problem so uh, it's very important that we can combine this these things somehow um, maybe you can say something about yeah. it how, ca how can we uh, how can we motivate people to reduce things but uh, without saying it without fe feeling guilty yeah. if we would if we f feel guilty I understand. Felt guilty otherwise. I understand what you're saying. When we started like this campaign with like one day a week veggie, we, we were thinking like, yes, yeah, should we do this? This is like sissy. This is like, I mean, what is this? Like one day a week, and this is like betraying our values, etc. So I would say to that that um, your values are about reducing animal suffering, right? That's that's what you want to be consistent with. And if you really believe, and as research points out, that some of these measures, some of these like the way you communicate to people uh, about not being vegan, but like taking steps, if you really believe, and there's reason to believe it, that this is more effective, then you are perfectly in line with your values, and that you're perfectly consistent with where you want to get. Veganism is not, an, is not an end, is not a goal, it's a means, right? So we use veganism to get to a cruelty-free world, right? And if what you say to people jives, coincides, with that ambition to go to a cruelty-free world, I think you're very much true to yourself and there should be no guilt at all. Does that make sense? I think many people have this problem. They won't say uh, COVID Yeah. COVID. Yeah, so that's what, I'm, what I mean. This could be a solution if you believe what I'm saying here. You don't have to. But um, so then, then, then you are still consistent with your, with your highest values. And you're not, I mean, it's not so much important to be consistent with your theories and with your dogma and with your ideology. It's, to, it's important to be consistent with what you really, really want. And that is like a cruelty-free world. And if you believe what you're saying is leading people in that direction the fastest way possible, then you're very much consistent and then there should be no guilt. <coughs> you can think about it, if it makes sense. Hi. Um, Where? Hi. Um, first of all, I'm not an angry vegan, even though I might look like it. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think it's that much of a question. I more need you to clarify something for me. And it might be hard for me to define uh, in, in English, but you talked about that meat reducers make it easy to turn vegan. But isn't it the other way around, that vegans actually made it easy for meat reducers to reduce? Um, and one question though, do you have any data that meat reducers actually turn vegans over time? Because I was vegetarian first and then I turned vegan. Um, and that was because of vegans, not because of meat reducers. I don't even think that was a concept back then. Yeah. Well, this is the two different things. I mean, you, you became vegan probably because you talked to some vegans and you understood the arguments, but what I mean with the fact that with the influence that meat producers have on you subconsciously without their awareness and unintentionally is because they're like larger in numbers and they exercise a greater influence on demand and supply. So because there are so many, the, the, there's more and more companies who are well catered to that bigger group. They wouldn't necessarily be interested in catering to the 2% vegans or the 1% or the half percent vegan. So that's the way in which they influence. So your, your ideology gets, certainly gets influenced by the vegans, but your, it is facilitated by the, redu by the big group of reducers in society. That's the, that's the difference between the moral and the non-moral thing, you see? It's both, it's not either or, it's, it's really both. Yeah, I'm just, what I'm just saying is that don't underestimate the importance of reducers and of talking about reductionism and of being happy with reducers also. That's, that's my main thing because I see so much hostility towards um, 
reduce sectarian messages, etc., and they're very, very important. It doesn't mean that if you feel better with that, that, that you shouldn't talk about veganism. You can if you want, of course. And like I said, in certain circumstances you must, but don't, certainly don't, if somebody else does something like with Meatless Monday or something, don't say uh, that, it's, that it's bullshit or that Meatless Monday is like uh, allowing people to, to uh, be a racist six days a week, like that kind of stupid comparisons, you know? Um, so it's, it's, my message is really like appreciate, re re reduce, appreciate every step, appreci appreciate incrementalism, and especially appreciate people who, <coughs> Intentionally or not, make it easier. <coughs> Sorry for society yeah. and for people to become vegan. Yeah, I, I agree on that because uh, we need meat reducers um, for the environment, right? But do you have any like data or proof that meat reducers yeah. will turn vegan over time? Yeah. Well, there's certainly a lot of data on um, how vegetarians become vegans. Um, so 90% or something of the vegans were vegetarians before. And most people seem to forget that, and, and most people seem to think that they went vegan overnight. Even Francione says that, but he didn't. So, uh, um, it, it's, it's, uh, and yeah, there, there is proof that people like, like start, I mean, there is even proof that people start caring first about, uh, about humane meat and then progress towards. Uh, so it's in, the, in that sense, it's, like it's opening a door and, and it's like, it's taking the first step and then you want to be consistent with your first step and you move along, etc. So there's, there's quite some, some research. I, I would advise uh, Veganomics by Nikuni to, to read that if you haven't read it. That's the most, um, the, the book that, that is a, the best summary of the research that's available. Um, and unfortunately, we, we are investing more and more. Nick Cooney and some other people recently received $300,000 um, to investigate, to do research into what drives people. And I think this is really important and really uh, worthwhile. Phonolytics also is an organization you can follow uh, on the web for research and, and to see what, what really works. And there's a lot of humane labs, uh, other things. Yeah. I guess we don't have time for uh, more questions, but I, you will be around, I suppose. I beg your pardon? You will be around outside. I'm around till Saturday, four o'clock, I think. And so tomorrow at ten is my is my other talk where we talk about mm -hmm. more about personal interactions and uh, and and what we should say, how we should communicate, etc. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.